for 2020, for which we are presenting this certificate with the portrait of Sir Richard Maine, the Cambridge graduate who was one of the first two co-commissioners of the Metropolitan Police Service, appointed in 1829, serving 39 years and dying in office, an example to us all. Uh, he uh, is certainly um, uh, often mentioned as one of the sources of the Pelian principles of policing. And we are very proud to be associated with it. We're very proud to have Tony Alderman uh, whoops, <laughs> conduct this award, which shows you how to drop awards. <laughs> That's still good. <laughs> yes. Uh, just uh, testing how solid this award is. And the answer is it passed the test, right? <laughs> just as Tony did. So, Tony, if we could actually use the videographer to hold up this award. Yep. Uh, and uh, you can hold it because I'm giving it to you. There you are. <laughs> Thanks very much, Larry. Thank you. And we look forward to your address. Please proceed. Thanks very much, Larry. And um, thank you to everyone for having me back. Um, I'll take you back this afternoon to a, a quieter time, 2018, 2019, where we were all looking forward with unbridled optimism towards the 2020s. And that's really worked out well for us. Um, so I'm here today uh, to present to you on, on the work that I actually did in the um, thesis that I um, delivered when I was doing my MST, so 2018-2019, um, which was a, so we talked about block randomization, we've talked about cluster randomization. I did a blocked cluster randomized controlled trial. Um, on the effect of the Think You Know program, which is a police-delivered online safety program for children in Australia. Um, there is a UK version of Think You Know, and Australia sort of licensed that back in 2009. Um, it, it's quite different these days to what it actually is over here. Over here, it's largely, as I understand it, sort of an online resource and, and interactive sort of learning environment for teachers, et cetera, who then go and deliver it to their own students. In Australia, it's actually a for the students, it's a, a police delivered program. Um, it's been going since 2009. Um, and, whoops, wrong laptop there. Um, and in 2018 19, it was actually delivered to over 220,000 students nationally around the country. So there's a big question about um, why is it important that we actually undertake evaluation so that we know what is actually working. Um, if you're looking at it from the, the just right policing, how do we know that we've got the delivery of this right if we haven't actually ever done an evaluation of it? And up until uh, the time where I did my study, the sort of level of evaluations were the sorts of, you know, forms you might get after you do a, a, a training package. Did you find it interesting? Did you find it useful? Um, you know, across the board, everyone was always like, yep, this is great. But we had no understanding about whether it actually made a difference, whether it actually imparted any new knowledge to students, whether it was a use, um, a good use of police resources. Um, as I said, it's, it's going out across the country delivered by all of our police forces nationally. Um, and so it was very pertinent to actually go and actually look at that and to use a structured RCT uh, approach to be able to, to get something in terms of being able to make some causal statements that actually this does indeed work or it doesn't work. So as I said, the, the curriculum is primarily focused on child exploitation, um, but it also includes broader cyber safety principles, protective behaviours to stay safe online, um, pre prevent cyber bullying, online grooming and to promote respectful relationships. So I had a number of sub-research questions. The main one was what is the effect of the Think You Know program on online safety in year five to eight public school um, pupils within the Australian Capital Territory? So Australian public schools are our government funded sort of run of the mill ones, not your sort of um, private sort of schools or anything like that. So specific sub-questions that I identified um, that I wanted to examine through the course of the actual experiment um, included, does, does Think You Know improve students' knowledge of online safety? Um, does it affect risk perceptions in terms of the certainty of getting caught or the severity of punishment for cyberbullying or other sort of deviant online behaviours? Does it reduce risky behaviours for students themselves for both perpetration of things, so being a cyberbully online, um, participating in image-based abuse, um, or does it you know, um, reduce risky behaviours in terms of promoting better protective practices online, using privacy filters, those sorts of things? Does Think You Know affect the stated likelihood to report cyber victimisation? Because we do know that that sort of victimisation does go very um, 
badly underreported. Um, and also then as a, a side piece um, to say, as it is a police delivered program, um, does it actually have any effect on students' perceptions of police legitimacy? Does it actually make students more positively disposed towards police or negatively disposed? Um, so yeah, that was the, the full range of things. Um, there was a lot of questions, or sorry, comments that have been made over the last couple of days and I'm sure over previous blocks that students have talked about um, some of the challenges and difficulties in actually having, um, getting police to do what you want them to do in these sorts of interventions. Um, so I thought why not involve students and kids as well, um, just to make it that little bit more challenging. So um, effectively I undertook two cluster randomised controlled experiments, so the two separate blocks for years five, sixes and years seven and eight as the separate block. Um, that was conducted over approximately 10 weeks uh, in the third term of the Australian school term, so between about July, August, September. Uh, in total, um, there was nearly 1,200 year five to six students um, in 53 separate classes across 12 primary schools, which actually equated to 16.9% of the entire school population for those years in the ACT. Um, and we had a 95.75% response rate, so very, very high, and I'll, I'll explain that very briefly, how I was able to achieve that very high response rate. Um, and then for the year seven and eights, which are our first two years of uh, high school or secondary school in Australia, there was 49 classes across four separate high schools. Um, and yeah, 888 students, which again was 13.5%. So it was actually a very sizable proportion of the actual entire ACT public school population. Um, and again, not quite as high a response rate, but still we had 90.77% response rate. It, it was a very high response there. Why did I actually undertake the blocking? Why was it done as two separate experiments with the blocking? I think that's been gone over a lot in the last few days. It's about ensuring that if you're going to actually have um, sort of heterogeneous heterogeneity in different sort of clusters or groups within each of the, um, you don't want to have a situation where you're um, inadvertently introducing skew into um, or bias into either your control group or your treatment group. And so creating these blocks actually um, allowed us to ensure we had um, much sort of even, much more even split between the control and the treatment groups. Um, the Think You Know program has got a stepped curriculum change, so every two years the curriculum expands and becomes more um, detailed, it starts dealing with more adult concepts, so the, the older school students, for example, start dealing with things like image-based abuse, um, sexting, revenge porn, those sorts of things that we probably didn't really want to be talking to um, year five and six students about, and so that required and again um, justified splitting those into two separate actual experiments there. Um, also there you've got different levels of reading and comprehension between year five to six in sort of upper primary school students and um, lower secondary school students and, and by having them blocked as two separate but related experiments that allowed us to ensure that the survey instrument that was developed for the experiments um, was appropriately tailored to that sort of level of comprehension um, so that they were able to actually d deal with both uh, content that was appropriate to their age group and to the curriculum that they got when they um, received the Think You Know program um, but was also tailored to their sort of levels of cognitive development as well. This is just a very brief piece um, on the sort of individual characteristics that we collected through the actual experiments themselves. So we had a whole range of demographic stuff in the background, um, which was really about ensuring that, um, again, we could compare and do some testing to make sure that the control and treatment groups were similar. Um, we then had, um, as I said, an intervention variable. We had a control group who received no intervention and a treatment group which had the think you know intervention. The way that was actually delivered um, is what's known as a post-test design. So rather than having um, the students undertake the survey twice, um, they actually did it, um, the control group received the online instrument, survey instrument, before Think You Know had been delivered. The treatment group received it after Think You Know. And so with the cluster, um, the clustering that occurred within an actual school, it was delivered to effectively the entire age groups at one time, so that the police were in there only delivering the course for the students once. This actually meant that we didn't need to go and schedule separate delivery for control group students or for treatment group students, so that they all received the course at exactly the same time and received the same content. Um, and then we were able to minimise the disruption to the school by just saying, okay, some of the classes, if they've been assigned through the random clusters to the control group, received the online survey instrument immediately before the actual um, 
presentation was provided to them. For the treatment group, they received it immediately afterwards. So it was about trying to minimise that disruption on students. Um, it was also um, about trying to minimise the impact on police resourcing as well. So given that there's dedicated teams that are delivering this, and as you saw, there are a number of these that get delivered throughout the year, um, having to duplicate and go back to the same school multiple times was a really inefficient use of that police resourcing. So the way that it was structured was also intended to, to minimise the disruption and the impost on them. Um, the other reason for the post-test design without actually then doing the survey twice um, was about getting securing the agreement from the ACT education sector, because um, it wasn't just about working with students and police, but it was also bureaucrats in the education sector, um, and ensuring that they were satisfied that the design maximised privacy protections for students and minimised, um, again, any opportunity for their personal information to be um, disclosed or collected or misused through the actual experimental process itself. So this way, as long as they were there on the day, I didn't need to track that they'd been there once and then track a second time if we were administering it, um, the survey instrument at a different time. So it was all about having that real pragmatic approach to saying your experimental design needs to be something that can be actually delivered in the real world, otherwise it's going to fall over and is designed to maximise the actual, in this case, response rate to the survey because the lower the, the survey response rate, obviously that would have lower confidence in the results themselves. So this is just very, I'll just duck through this very quickly. It was just to show you that there's very um, broadly similar distribution between the control and treatment groups um, for both blocks, the years fives and sixes and the years sevens and eights. Um, looking at average hours spent on the internet between them. Um, this is one that I'll just very briefly touch on, which again was, um, wasn't anticipated ahead of time, but again, um, I think justifies the blocking process and was just interesting in terms of um, policy considerations for changes to the curriculum going forward. This shows effectively two separate patterns of um, access to internet c connected devices at home, um, where there's actually, if you look at that middle column, um, which is actually tablets, um, the high school students use tablets far less than the primary school students and just was demonstrating a different pattern of usage to internet controlled devices and the way in which they're actually accessing those. Um, and I think that's relevant in terms of both the design of the curriculum and how you're actually talking about engaging with kids and being able to ensure that the structure of the um, curriculum that you're delivering is tailored to the sort of way in which they're using the internet and accessing these sorts of things online. Um, I'll jump into some of the results here now quickly. So the first was around um, knowledge. There was, in terms of the survey instrument, there was, um, uh, it was developed in partnership with the University of Queensland, the survey instrument, and, and was based on um, a whole range of different previous studies as well that had been used to examine different things. So the knowledge items were actually developed based on the Think You Know curriculum. Um, they were a whole range of true-false questions. Um, and there was two different sets for years five and six and seven, eight that was um, basically tailored, as I said, to the curriculum there. Um, there was two subcategories for the years fives and sixes, um, which the sevens and eights also had. So there was online safety questions and then questions that were related to cyberbullying. And the years sevens and eights also had a series of questions that related to image-based abuse, um, which again, as I mentioned, was sort of content that wasn't deemed to be really appropriate to the years fives and sixes and was outside what was being delivered through the actual program. So it wasn't deemed to be appropriate to have that included there. Now, in terms of... Um, these here, we actually did see, um, you can sort of see the blue, the blue bars are the, um, the treatment groups and the yellows are the uh, control group um, clusters. There's reasonably high success rates across the board, even for control and treatment, um, but you can see all of the blue bars are higher. So we had treatment sort of favouring or results favouring treatment in all circumstances. Um, however, those were statistically significant for online safety for both years five, sixes and years seven and eight, um, and statistically significant in relation to cyberbullying for the years fives and sixes, but not for the years sevens and eights, um, which already had very high scores of sort of getting close to sort of 80% correct there. Um, again, in terms of the image-based abuse, while the results were favouring the treatment group, those weren't statistically significant but they were approaching statistical significance. Um, this next one, um, I won't go into this in too much detail. This was just a, a bit of a, a forest plot that was done just to demonstrate the individual um, sort of questions themselves and the spread of results that we did see. Um, 
many of you will have seen these sorts of plots before. Um, the center line with the zero in the middle there um, is sort of the, the null point. Um, the, the, the farther away from that middle point the box is to the right is favoring treatment. The ones with the boxes to the left of the zero is where the results were favoring the control, which means that the, the treatment group did worse than the control group. So for the vast majority of questions, um, you can see that the, the treatment group was getting um, uh, effectively, this was done using effect sizes. So we didn't take into account correlations or anything like that. So it doesn't necessarily um, have some of the same sort of uh, strength as the t-test the ones that I was showing you just before. But it was demonstrating that, you know, you can see the diamonds there. The top ones there was the years fives and sixes. That sort of had a larger on average effect than what the, um, the, the year sevens and eights which again sort of mirrors, mirrors this one here, just saying that effectively the years fives and sixes seem to be learning more from the program than the years um, seven and eights did. In terms of perceived certainty of apprehension, um, this was done on um, a STEM question with please read the following scenarios and then indicate how much risk there is of getting caught and punished with an, a four point response scale from no risk to a very great risk. Um, the STEM and the response options, they were adapted from um, previous research on deterrence and juvenile offending. Um, so three out of four was sort of um, already seeing that there was a fairly high risk. What that was showing was that regardless of control or treatment, um, the students that were involved actually thought there was a fairly high degree of chance of being caught for being bad online, um, which is a good thing. Um, there was, while there was very sort of small um, <laughs> results favouring treatment, no, they weren't statistically significant for either the years five, sixes or the sevens and eights. Um, likewise, in terms of perceived severity of punishment, some very small um, numbers favouring treatment, but th they were approaching a null result um, for the years fives and sixes and sevens and eights. So there didn't seem to be any real measurable effect in terms of perceived um, severity of punishment coming out of the Think You Know program. In terms of likelihood of perpetration, so this is, you know, um, effectively um, how likely are you to be dodgy online and go and commit cyberbullying and those sorts of deviant behaviours. Um, again, everyone was very much like, no, no, I would never do that. This is something to, to examine after. It's a police delivered program. Um, whether um, the fact that it wasn't police delivering the actual survey instrument, but they knew that there was police about to deliver this. Um, if police go and ask you, oh, how likely are you to go and commit a crime? You're probably not that likely to answer yes. Um, I would think that's a hypothesis that probably doesn't necessarily need too much testing um, in this context here. But regardless, um, as I said, there was a very small um, but not statistically significant uh, changes favouring the treatment groups in that case. Where we do again start to see some small changes though and some statistically, statistically significant responses for the year fives and sixes for that younger age group is in the stated likelihood of using protective behaviours. So that's things about um, you know, when you download an app, will you go and actually then check the privacy settings to make sure that they're, they're, they're actually um, put on the strictest settings so that you're not sharing information unnecessarily. Um, if someone you don't know is asking you to um, go and meet up with them, are you going to go and do that? Um, those were the sorts of scenarios that were put to them in that context. And so, um, again, good to see some, um, for both groups, um, results favouring treatment, but not statistically significant for that older age group. Um, and in terms of the actual response they were getting, it was already a very high baseline for both the control and treatment groups. The next question was around likelihood to report. Um, sorry, this is a very busy graph to sort of try and read online um, or, or just up on the screen there. So um, effectively, um, they were asked, how likely would you be to report or to deal with certain things if you experienced a cyber sort of or an online incident? Um, would you, how likely would you be to go and um, report that to a trusted adult, be it a parent or a teacher? Um, how likely to go to police? How likely would you be to go to your friends? And how likely would you be to just deal with that yourself? Um, so some interesting observations there, which is that some of the older age cohort were more likely to suggest for both treatment and control um, that they would either handle something themselves or deal with their friends um, or use their friends to try and deal with the incident rather than going to um, parents. Um, but for 
both, uh, both blocks, um, we saw a statistically significant change favouring treatment for would you, be go would you be likely to go and report something to the police? Um, and that was particularly as well, noting some of the really big changes that we saw in the earlier knowledge questions, um, where there was some of the largest response, um, r largest differences between the control and treatment groups were for some of the questions that related to things like um, cyberbullying is, um, is, is against school rules, but it's not against the law. And that was actually framed as, an, as a negative sort of a question. We had them framed differently, but um, that was one where there was a, a huge, like a, a very large effect size in terms of the, the number of students that in the treatment groups that started getting that answer correct after the treatment compared to those that didn't. So suggesting that there was a real deficit of information, um, that these things aren't just not cool, they're actually against the law in Australia. And that means that you can approach police to try and have these issues addressed if, that, if you're a victim of that. So that, that potentially explains part of that change there. Um, the final question uh, that was looked at through there was around police legitimacy. Um, it was an interesting one. Um, Lorraine Maserol and a number of others have looked at some of these things about um, the effects of sort of police delivered programs on, on perceptions of legitimacy. Um, I wasn't really sure whether we'd see something at all, which is one of the reasons why it's always good to actually test out some of these things. Um, and, and there was actually, and, and also to make sure that there wasn't sort of a backfire effect. We wanted, to, didn't want, we wanted to ensure that, you know, even if there wasn't, that we were aware of any negative outcomes in relation to how students perceived police from these sorts of um, programs. Um, again, for both groups, we actually saw results that favoured treatment, um, but we did not see um, statistically significant results for years seven to eight, although it was approaching statistical significance. It was getting there as 0.15. Um, but for the year five to sixes, we did see a, a statistically significant difference there um, at a probability of 0 0.026. Some of the policy implications that came out of this. So um, does it work? Is it worth actually sending police in to schools to actually help uh, teach them about these things, given all of the other stuff that they learn about cyber safety in various other ways and parts of the curriculum? Um, well, it, there's question marks about whether the costs are actually sort of appropriate and whether, this, whether police delivered interventions are, are necessarily the best way of getting that out. But we can now say that across a number of those dimensions um, within the ACT, think you know um, definitely works. Um, there was measurable changes in terms of the knowledge of students um, once they'd actually received that compared to the control group. Um, from a policy perspective and with resource restrictions in terms of where you're actually targeting those resources, we saw greater effects for years fives and six, generally speaking, than years sevens and eights. Um, and the years sevens and eights also had sort of generally higher baseline at control um, and treatment for, for both, for all of the dimensions there. So if you have a question about whether you're gonna be sending um, a course to a primary school or to a high school, um, then that would sort of suggest you'd probably be better off sending those, those um, resources to the primary school and getting in with the younger kids because you're gonna have greater bang for buck there. Um, we've got greater effects for safety and prevention angles than deterrence. Um, so that can inform future adjustments to the content to maximise impact, although there's probably some further work that needs to be done um, to ensure that the, the lack of a difference that we were seeing there wasn't from other effects, as I said, in terms of, um, you know, are you going to fess up to police that you'd consider yourself likely to go and commit some sort of cyber crime? Um, and as I said, we've got high baseline performance um, of control group clusters for both age groups. So while um, Think You Know does have measurable impact in a number of dimensions, um, without that, there's actually still a fairly high level of um, cyber safety um, within those sort of even year five to six cohorts, which is quite, um, quite good. Um, but there is still value in going and having that reinforced um, by this police delivered intervention. In terms of opportunities for future research, um, there is a question mark about the retention of benefits over time. As I said, the, the, the way in which, um, in order to be able to successfully deliver the experiment, the actual measurement was um, identified for the treatment group immediately after delivery of the program. And so there is a real question about just how long would those measurable differences um, last for? Um, would it just be a flash in the pan? Would they forget about some of those things? Um, question marks around the translation of benefits into changes in behavior. That would be very, um, a, a far more time consuming and 
ethically difficult um, experiment to run because you would need to be actually tracking children over time um, and that posed a whole range of issues there um, but certainly worth going and exploring that um, would we actually see those changes in knowledge translate to better behaviours online and how could you construct an experiment that would go and look at those things um, there are other age groups think you know is delivered from everything down to preschool and kindergarten in Australia all the way through to years 11 and 12 um, so, you know, what, what's the actual impact on those? Um, it would again be quite challenging in some ways to do it for younger age groups because you start to get to a situation with an online administered survey. Um, their reading and comprehension skills would be something that would be very um, challenging to craft a, um, an instrument that allowed you to sort of reliably collect the sorts of information that you wanted to test those things. Um, and again, other Australian jurisdictions. So the Australian Capital Territory is effectively a very small city state. Um, we have one urban centre, um, about 450,000 people. Um, the jurisdictions that are delivering it, we may well see that Queensland police who are out there in remote regional Queensland um, would have either a different style of delivering the program or it would be received differently by students. Um, so it's certainly the sort of experiment that would benefit from replication in other jurisdictions in Australia. Um, and there was a few knowledge backfires that came through that I didn't talk about because I am limited in time here um, and it's getting late in the afternoon for everyone. Um, but there was a few backfires in knowledge which would be useful to explore to make sure that the way the curriculum is, is framed um, doesn't have any sort of it was around things like um, cyber bullies, even if they're trying to be anonymous, can still be caught by police. And you go, well, yes, that is true. It can be challenging, but it's worthwhile. Um, that, was, that sort of backfired. So you don't inadvertently want a situation where some people might feel that um, the presentation has sort of scared them into going, well, this situation is far scarier and worse, and so there's no point taking action about these sorts of things. So that's another area to look at in future.